Amen. This time, Shelly's going to come, and she has a special song for us. We're excited to hear from you this morning, Shelly. Beautiful, beautiful. A question that uh, you have heard many times, I'm sure, in the last few days is this, are, are you ready for Christmas? <laughs> I suppose that's the question that's uh, really being asked is are you having uh, all your decorations up? Have you finished your Christmas shopping? Have you mailed your Christmas cards? Have you marked on your calendars everywhere you're going to have to be in the next uh, few days. Are you ready for Christmas? 
It's this time of year that we sometimes find ourselves coming and going. Uh, we call it the, the Christmas rush. Uh, sometimes the Christmas seasons become very hectic for us in our life. And because of this, we tend to forget uh, the emphasis and the reason that we gather together uh, this time of year on these special occasions. There's an inter interesting Christmas story that I read about a little girl who watched her mom and dad get ready for Christmas. And to her, it seemed like mom and dad were very preoccupied. Dad was preoccupied with the burdens and the bundles, and mom was concerned with the parties and the presents, and they just really had no time for her. It seemed like to her, every time that they were talking to her, it was, would you please get out of the way? And to her, this Christmas season was uh, not what she thought it should be. So one night, late in December, she knelt by her bedside and she prayed this prayer. Father, forgive, uh, fa he said, our Father who are in heaven, please forgive us our Christmases as we forgive those who Christmas against us. I liked it, and then I weeped for it. <laughs> but the question is, uh, are you ready for Christmas? And I'm asking more than about your activities and your ability to get everything done. I'm asking about your heart. I'm asking about your attitudes. Because every once in a while, you know, I'll hear somebody say, man, I just cannot get in the Christmas spirit. I don't know about you, but this year, Christmas got really fast. You know, just kind of like, you know, well, we had Thanksgiving, and then all of a sudden, wow, we're just all of a sudden here. And some people were saying it's really hard for me to get in the Christmas spirit uh, this year. And because of that, I thought maybe it's something you have said too. I thought, well, you know, let's look at what Christmas is really, uh, what it really means. Uh, let's think of it in terms of our Advent. Uh, we, we say Merry Christmas a lot, but really we represent and re recognize this time of year, the Advent, where God became a human being. God expressed his love by living among us. He came. This is what we lit the Christ candle today at Advent, that Christ came into this world for us with a specific purpose and message in mind for all of us. And that's what Christmas really means. So one of the things that is important is our right attitudes, our heart, that we can really make room for him in our lives every single day as it relates to our everyday, you know, day in, nine to five lives, whatever it is that we happen to have, that we make sure uh, that we are ready for Jesus, or ready for Christmas. So for a few minutes this morning, we're going to turn our attention to the Christmas stories recorded in Matthew chapter 1, verses 8 through 25. This is how the birth of Jesus came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be with child through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was a righteous man, he did not want to expose her to public disgrace. He had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because she is conceived in her. He who has conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. And she will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save the people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary as his wife, home as his wife. But he had no uh, union with her until she gave birth to a son. And he gave him the name Jesus. Now, I don't know about you, but uh, I, you know, I like Joseph. I really, I really like him. He doesn't stand in the limelight very long. We don't know a whole lot uh, about his life. But Joseph can teach us a lot about the attitudes of getting ready for Christmas and what makes Christmas real in our lives. So I got three things I just want to share quickly this morning. The first one is that uh, we need to accept God's will during this time, whatever it might be. And the idea that we find from Joseph, he teaches us to accept God's will, whatever it might be. He was open to the will and the leading of the Spirit. Put yourself for a moment, if you can, in Joseph's position. 
Joseph thought his life was pretty well planned. He had it all set out. I'm going to get married. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. A little bit later, we'll have a kid. We're going to do all these things. This is what it was going to be. And he was pledged to, give, uh, to be uh, Mary's husband, which means that he and Mary would have all the necessary arrangements uh, that a, a wedding ceremony, if you know what that is like, would take place. I have an instrument that I use for premarital counseling. And one of the things that the instrument um, uh, measures is the, the, the stress of the couple. And if you, uh, this is premarital, so you can imagine uh, the, the fiancé of this guy uh, has a lot more stress than he does. Why is that? Because she's really concerned about the wedding ceremony and everything involved in the wedding ceremony. How many of you may have had a, a, a wife that said to you before you got married, listen, all you need to do is show up. I'll take care of everything else. Anybody have anybody say that to them? Uh, it wouldn't be unheard of. <laughs> I've heard it a lot. Listen, just be here, okay? I'll take care of this stuff. You just be here. Uh, or what color do you want? I don't care. Just, you know, as long as you're there and I'm there. That's kind of what a guy thinks. And uh, Joseph had some plans. He had some things thought up. But the stress is always seems to be on the bride. So this time of life for them is not any different than anybody else's time of life that they're getting married and planning and making these arrangements. But something really came in and messed with all of those things. Joseph knew that he was going to wed Mary, and they would settle down in Nazareth. He would continue uh, in his carpentry business, and they would live happily ever after as the story might go. But then Mary came to him and said, Joseph, I'm expecting a baby. Put yourself back in that place again. You know, you know you haven't been together uh, as a couple. You know you've been saving yourselves for each other in marriage, as is right and proper uh, according to God's word, and they were doing everything right. And all of a sudden, Mary comes and says, I am pregnant with a child. Must have hit them like a bombshell. I mean, think of it. I mean, come back, go back. You know, we have a nice, really, story, really cool story. And Joseph, he's kneeling, and Mary's kneeling, and it's all great. You know, this whole idea is, is wonderful and fantastic. But what is the inner turmoil? I'm a psychologist. I can't help but read the story differently. I can't help read the story with a little bit of angst in it. With a little bit of, what are people thinking? You ever get that idea? What are people thinking? What are they going to, are they going to, what are they, you know, when I walk by, what do they say? How many know that that's a struggle for a lot of us? Uh, what are they going to say about me? What about this? What about that? And all these things, I mean, there just had to be a ton of stuff. Now, I don't know about you, but when I get stressed a little bit, uh, it, sleep comes hard for me. I mean, it's like my mind just races, right? Anybody have that problem? Your mind races at night? What is that? Come on. I'm like, turn it off, Lord, please, you know? What, you know just put on one of my sermons that'll help you sleep and just lull you, you know? Lull you, you know? I can give you a dull sermon sometime, you know, but listen to what I'm saying, man. This stuff was, it, it, it can get to you. It can mess with you. And I want you to know that the stuff that messes with us internally expresses itself externally. It can't help but do that. And I wonder what those conversations were like that we're not privy, privy to between the lines of the Bible. Because you and I know that these were regular, ordinary people that had something extraordinary and supernatural happen to them, something that had never happened before. There was no precedent for it. I tried to think in my mind, Bob, what is it that you have in your life that could even come close to this kind of disequilibrium that you must have? And I, I really had a hard time thinking of anything at all. The only thing I could point to that had a little tiny bit of this was the morning that I got saved. I was a secular kid from a secular family that never darkened the doors of a church in my entire life for any reason. If there was someone who died and you had to go to church to say goodbye to them, we just waved <laughs> as we drove by. I don't know what the deal was, but my family never went to church. So I didn't really study church things. If you've gone to church in your life, you might know a lot of different doctrines, a lot of different things that a lot of different churches believe. I had zero belief system at all, except I knew that there was a Jesus, and he was on a cross because I grew up in Chula Vista, California, very Hispanic uh, community, and lots of crucifixes on all the walls of my friend's house. So I would go by, and I'd see him on the cross, you know, and I didn't know what he had done. Didn't know why he was there, but I knew that was Jesus. I probably asked somebody one time, is that a relative of yours? 
You know, who's that? You know, what'd he do? I don't know. You know what secular people think about when they don't know anything about it. And so I came to church one morning. Why? Because the Holy Spirit had drew, drew me there and I had these internal questions of angst that I needed to resolve in my life. No. I came to church because a girl asked me. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm sure she loved me. I don't know, because as soon as I met Jesus, I forgot about her. <laughs> but I loved her, you know, at least across the street, you know, uh, from my house is where she lived. And, and she asked me to come to church, and I did. And when the pastor started preaching, man, something happened. There was some, some stuff going on inside of me that I never really felt before. Something that was, was causing me to come to tears. Now, being from Chula Vista in the 1960s and 70s, pretty rough area, you didn't cry. If you cried, guess what? You got pounced on. If you showed your weakness, guess what? You're done. Okay, so I grew up in that community uh, where you don't show those weaknesses. You don't show the underbelly, the softness of your heart. If old Yeller died, which he did, by the way, sorry to spoil that for you, but old Yeller died, and I, I think I cried, but I cried, you know, internally. <laughs> so this whole idea of me crying in the middle of service was like, man, I bent down to tie my converse about five times while I was wiping the tears away because I didn't want to be seen as crying, but something had captured me. It was the Holy Spirit. And so I came up to the church altar, and I came up when the pastor said, come on down. Now, I don't know if you've ever seen a Spike Lee movie, but in most Spike Lee movies, there's a scene where people, they walk from one side of the room to the other side, and just like they're being towed, and they really are being towed, but it, they're just kind of like transporting. I don't remember walking from that back pew down to the front. I feel like I just glided down there and ended up there. And the pastor told me this. He said, I want you to pray you know, for, you, for God to save you of your sins. And he told me what that, so I did. And I prayed and I cried and I felt the immediate release of all my sins being washed away. The burden that I had been carrying, which was heavy, I thought I was big enough to carry it, but I wasn't, and it fell away. And I opened up my eyes and I felt wonderful. I felt elated, I felt phenomenal. And there was a guy next to me, he's probably in his mid-20s. I thought he was an older guy at that point in time. And I was 16, he said, now the pastor looked over at me and put his hand on my shoulder, now I want you to pray that God will give you everything he has for you today. And I said, okay. I thought he just did, but okay. So I did, and I prayed the prayer that he asked me to pray. And all of a sudden, something weird started happening. I started doing something I never even knew existed in the world. I started speaking in a language I'd never heard before. I did not know there was such a thing as this thing of speaking in tongues. I had no idea it was there. And all of a sudden, Bobby Cave, this secular piece of junk kid that only lived for himself, was doing something that was supernatural that I had no control over in the sense of, of it was happening to me. I could stop any time. I had that control, but it was just coming. And I was like, okay, so I did it. And uh, my grandkids and I laugh about it because it's kind of like an elf when he belches really, really loud at the table and said, did you hear that? <laughs> you know, I was like, that's what I said to the guy after I was speaking in tongue for a minute or two. I said, did you hear that? I didn't, I didn't understand anything coming out of my mouth. You know, and I, and I didn't feel weird, you know. Now, I know what feeling weird was spiritually. The only spiritual thing I remember was trying to watch um, Rosemary's Baby or trying to watch The Exorcist, some movie like that. Who knows what it was, but some crazy evil thing that I was watching. And I felt some spirit. And I, t I shut that down right away and just stopped doing that because it made me feel weird. This didn't make me feel weird. It tickled me. Do you know what I mean by tickles you? And you're not laughing out loud about it, but you're kind of, <laughs> what's that? <gasps> but it felt okay. It felt right. And then the guy would tell me, that's right, it's in the Bible, all over the Bible. And I was like, oh, it was so supernatural. It was not something I expected or even heard about. It was the weirdest thing. And I was so excited about it, really. My salvation was the most important thing in my life. And I had this other thing that locked it in for me. I don't know about you, but I could doubt stuff. But when something supernatural happens, it's really hard to doubt it. 
And I remember going home to my mom. I told you a million times. My mom said, when I said, I became a Christian today, mom. I got saved. And she said, we'll see. And at the time, I thought it was a terrible thing to say, but it was a beautiful thing to say. Because what she was saying was, if you're a Christian now, your life will be different. You and I will no longer have arguments and fights like we do. You will no longer, you know, get in fights at school. You will no longer steal. You no longer lie. It's going to be great, Bobby. This is going to be great. And I was like, okay, this is awesome. And mom, guess what? Something else happened. Now, what I didn't know was my mother was an ex-Baptist that are not real open to the gifts of the Spirit. And when I said, hey, Mom, listen to this, she just smacked my face <laughs> when I was speaking in tongues. And I was like, it kind of shocked me, you know, because the pastor didn't smack me. Everybody in church was happy about it. I come home, my mom smacks me about it. And it wasn't a hard smack. It wasn't her mad smack. It was her stop that smack. But I knew what was going on. And she said, we're going to have to have a talk with that pastor. And I said, well, Mom, if you had a Bible... You can look up where you do that. It's all over. <laughs> it's all over the Bible. Some places you can see it. You know, and I, was, I didn't know what to tell her. But I knew something supernatural had happened to me. Joseph is standing there with his wife saying, his, his, his espoused wife, his girlfriend, his fiance, and saying, I'm pregnant. Now, that's not a spiritual statement. We know how pregnant happens. Most of you. I won't tell you if you don't. It's your parents' job. Now I just made it harder, sorry. <laughs> anyway, that's something that's physical, not something that we would think is spiritual, but all of a sudden, here's this thing that's happening spiritual to Mary. You see, it was a spiritual thing that happened. It was something that they had no, no idea about. There had never been anything like this ever in the world of virgin birth. That doesn't happen. It was amazing. It was miraculous. It was supernatural. But it was something that happens in the natural. I love Joseph. I'm sure he had some difficulty with this. It hit him like a bombshell. He thought that he knew Mary and loved her. And now seemingly she had been unfaithful to him because she's having a baby. He knew this child was not his. It was the only conclusion that he could reach. And the only conclusion was that she was unfaithful. She had broken the bond that existed between them. According to the law, Mary should be stoned. But Joseph loved her so much that he didn't want to do that. He decided he was going to divorce her quietly because that's what he thought was the best thing to do. This Christmas story has the D-I-V-O-R-C word in it. Our Christmas story has humanity written all over it. And I don't want you just to get to think about the miracles and the supernatural, but it had everything that we might know and feel in the story. He decided to divorce her quietly. As he was thinking about this, an angel came to him in a dream and in effect said, Joseph, trust God. He is in this. Trust God. He is in this. He had no context for this. No ability to look it up and say, see, this is what happens if you're a godly woman. You could have a baby by God. It never happened before. He had no context. The rabbis had no idea about what to say about this, of course. You may not understand all that is happening, but trust God, everything will be all right. Now, Joseph was evidently a man of faith, but sometimes, you know, it's hard to live by faith. If God doesn't, you know, doesn't always do what we expect him to do, uh, if he did, it might be easier for us to have some faith, but when God doesn't do what we expect to do, it's hard. I've told the story many times. I was minding my own business in my house in Los Angeles, and I was praying about what God had for Sandra and I and Bobby and Heather, what we were going to do in this next season of our life. As uh, my pastor was uh, moving on and uh, we were deciding what it is that God was going to do and what we were going to, where we were going to go. And I was sitting there, God brought to my, to my spirit a place that I had no idea existed in the world. I know that you know Overland Park, Kansas. I never heard of it. Overland Park, okay? It's a city built over land and a park. I don't know. I have no context 
for Overland Parker. That's what God said to me. And he said that, and it was, again, some disequilibrium in me. Because he didn't say Overland Park, California, which is what I thought I would love to hear, because I'm a Cali boy, and that's where I'm from, and that's where I was raised, and that's my home, and that's where my family is. And God said Overland Park, Kansas. I thought maybe, you know, I heard it wrong. Is Overland one word or two, Lord? <laughs> I had questions. My main question went to Sandra, who knows a little about Kansas, and I said, honey, where's Overland Park, Kansas? And she told me. Now, I've been all over Kansas now, but before that, I had only been to Missouri when my grandpa died when I was eight, and that was it. I was eight, I didn't know anything about it. I went to a park somewhere. That's all I can remember about my trip there. Cherry trees at my uncle's house and a Coke machine in his garage. Those are my memories. And I said, honey, where's Overland Park, Kansas? Where's Overland Park in Kansas? She said, it's not too far from where my folks live. It's the next city over. She goes, why? I said, I, I think we're supposed to go there. God said we're supposed to go to Overland Park, Kansas. I think Sandra might have thought, oh, just for vacation, for a trip? I said, no, we're supposed to move there. Yikes. Yikes. Now, being all over Kansas now, that I've been here 28 years, uh, there, there's not many places in Kansas I would live. <laughs> Honest with you. Not many places I'd want to be. I might be able to live in Lawrence, maybe. But that's about it. That's about it. You know, maybe. I don't know. That's a stretch. But it's still not too far from a city. I can do that. But Overland Park, it was not, it was disequilibrium for me. It was like, I don't know. I didn't look it up on the internet because Al Gore hadn't invented it really that much yet. No, that's not true. I had AOL then, and I still have it. And I will always have it. I want you to understand something. When God says something to you, you know, you, you're, you're sitting there, you might have disequilibrium. You might not even know what it's all about. But all of a sudden, God says it. You know it's his word. You know it was God. And so we did. I had to call the kids together. They were in high school. L.A. kids in high school, by the way, are not opened to Kansas. And I, as I said before, I think I may have promised a pony. Never delivered, but nevertheless, uh, my kids listened to the word of the Lord and we came. And it's been the best thing we've ever done in our lives. I mean, what would Bobby be without Jalea? All right? Seriously, I have no idea. I mean, I know where Heather would be. She'd still be here without Jeremy, but still, Jeremy? Oh, amazing awesome. It's like I hit the lottery twice with these guys. I mean, I'm sure they had some good people in California for my kids, but not these guys. Not Julie and Jeremy. And all of you. You see, this idea of Christmas, it's practical, it's human, and yet it's very supernatural and very otherworldly and very much a part of the miraculous things that we see and sense. But when Joseph Listen to what God said. When I heard what God said, you just do what God says, folks. Don't fight it. Just do what he says. Because he has your best interest at heart always. Always. I love this about God. I love this that he wants something for me that is better than what I want for myself. And I have to tell you, Joseph had to be a man of faith because he trusted God with this. Now, God's ways are not always our ways, amen? Yeah, if you spend any time with God at all, you know that's not true. I mean, that's true. His ways are not our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. And you may never understand everything that God is doing this side of heaven, but God says, trust me, and I'll make it all work out. Paul wrote, I know that all things will work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. That means those who follow him. Guess what? Life is going to be okay. You say, well, Pastor Bob, I wanted to have more money and a bigger job. Guess what? Maybe you can't handle it. You know there's things you can't handle. You should know by now. I wish I could play the guitar. I would love it. But I've told you before, I would be up here with this guitar right now, preaching, strumming my own little things, emphasizing my points with a guitar, if I could. 
I might do a little riff when I had a really good point. I don't know if I had those things. John, if I had your talent, forget it. It would be terrible. My friends, I have friends who can preach and they can play piano. Oh, those guys are amazing. Those guys are awesome. Sorry your pastor's not one of them. <laughs> Neither was your last one. Neither one of us can play the piano or the guitar and do that. But listen, God prepares us for what we can handle and what we can do in our life. And he's reminding us all the time that we need him. Stay with me for a moment. We talked on Wednesday night Zoom, which, by the way, is awesome. We got room for you. I got two screens on my computer, people. I can put you on the other side of the screen and see you. It's awesome. And we've been talking about the Sermon on the Mount. It's fantastic. It has been so much fun. And we recognize that God is always doing something. When he does his work in our lives, he's preparing us for things that we can't even understand. And I love what Jesus was telling us on the Sermon on the Mount. I love the instruction he was giving us to help us practically live our lives. And I love the fact that God's word is never wasted, that he enters our life enthusiastically, and he has the best for us. Just follow his path and stop deviating. Stop deviating. Stop going your way. But as you said on Wednesday night, we're talking about this idea of temptation. We talked about it a couple weeks ago on Sunday. God placed the Spirit of God in you and your flesh. Your flesh is part of God's plan. Hear me now. It's part of God's plan. Just like the law that we studied on Wednesday night, the law was given to us so we recognize we can't do it. We can't do it by ourselves. We need his help. And he put the Spirit of God in us, in our flesh, to remind us that we need him. That there's one God and you're not it. There's one God. He lives in you in this flesh bag that you are carrying around. He lives in you to help you during this Christmas season to know that, yes, you're human and divine. You have two sides to you. And my flesh tells me I need Jesus. Every day, by the way. Every day. Oh, even to a pastor? Yeah. Even to an old fogey pastor? Yeah. Yeah. I've not grown out of sin. I've grown out of some sins. But I've discovered some others. <laughs> and God is saying, hey, maximize your spirit, minimize your flesh. Kill the flesh be in the spirit. My favorite writer of the New Testament, Paul, the Apostle Paul, who was very spiritual. I mean, this guy knew the law like nobody else knew it. And he said, hey, I know what to do. And of course he does. He's, he's a Pharisee. Of course he knows. He studied the law his whole life. He knows exactly what to do. That's amazing. And he goes, but I can't do it. I want to do it, and right up until that moment, I'm going to do it, and then I sin. I don't want to do that. I hate that. I don't like that about me, but I still mess up, and that's me, and that's you. But when I mess up, here's what it does. It tells me, hey, Bob, you still need Jesus more. You need more of Jesus. Christmas happened because Joseph trusted God and we need to learn to trust him too. The next thing that will happen to us is it will help us to learn to carry, care for other people, to have other people's hearts and other people's needs in our life. Joseph's arrangement was a pretty simple one. This is the way we portray you know, Joseph in our Christmas plays. His idea was pretty simple. You just have to kind of go along with it. You remember in our Christmas plays that we used to have, remember that time we could have Christmas plays in church? Yeah, that was fun. We picture Mary very angelic, and Mary usually, you know, has some kind of glow about her. Uh, over on this side, we'd usually have the shepherds come in, and over here, you know, we would have the men with their gifts of frankincense, gold, since gold and myrrh. In the midst of all this, there was Christ's child in the manger, looking so pure and so clean. 
but over in the side there was, was Joseph standing there. No halo over his head. No real shine about him. Joseph just being there he isn't a starring role. It's an important one. His task is to take care of Mary and the baby Jesus. He had an important role in taking care of others. That's what Joseph was called to do, to take care. In the Catholic Church, they say, Hail Mary, full of grace, and Joe, you're pretty good too. That's about it. But understand that there is an important place for Joseph, for us. Christmas comes but once a year, and in this season, it probably causes us uh, to look around us a little more than what we have. It did for Joseph. There's much that needs to be done, and we can often, often find ourselves frustrated, but we still try. The one, most wonderful, uh, finest description title that can be given to a church is a church that really cares. Faith Chapel, when our first logo, first statements was Faith Chapel, Jesus cares, we care. And if Jesus cares, we should care too, by the way. If Jesus cares about that, then we should care. Jesus doesn't have to distinguish between which lives matter. It's all lives matter, and everybody must care for one another. Everybody, especially those that are downtrodden, those who need help, those who are having issues in life. The Bible always tells us that God was always one who is partial to the widows, partial to the orphans, partial to those in society that are marginalized and have needs. One of my favorite stories is about a young couple with an 18-month-old son. They had gone to spend some time with their grandparents at Christmas, and Christmas Day fell on a Sunday, so after Christmas they got on the road. They had to stop somewhere at a diner together um, to uh, have a meal before they got home on the halfway there. There weren't a lot of filling stations open on this particular Christmas day, but they found a truck stop that was open. So they stopped there to get something to eat. They went inside, you know, one of these roadside kind of dimly lit restaurants and sat down and found out that there were not many customers there on a Christmas day. Their little, their little boy named Eric was 18 months old, and uh, as they came in to get their seats, there was an older gentleman that was sitting there, and Eric just said, hi there. He had combined hi and there, and he said, hi there, hi there. That's what he would say, and this, the older guy would just respond back and said, hello, little boy, how are you doing? And every time, you know, they were looking at this older guy, uh, the, Eric would say, hi there. Hi there. And the, the man would play with them and talk to them, and, and they would kind of have this little conversation going on. But they looked at this guy a little bit more, and uh, he was a older and kind of ragged and tattered looking guy. His coat was several sizes too big, and it was old and it was torn, and his trousers drugged the floor. His shoes had holes in them, and his toes actually stuck out of one of his shoes. He had an old hat that was tilted on his head in a certain position, and he just looked pretty scruffy. And uh, when he smiled, he didn't have all of his teeth. It was a kind of a rough existence for this guy. And I'm sure he came into the diner on a Christmas day to get out of the cold. Yet for some reason, Eric was attracted to him. And he kept saying, hi there, hi there. And the guy would respond, and Eric would respond. And the parents looked at him and said, OK, let's, let's just have our meal. Let's get out of here really fast. This is a sketchy place. And I know you understand sketchy places. I'm sure that, uh, that Brett used to go to sketchy places until he had kids. <laughs> and now you don't take your kids to those sketchy places anymore. You know, you got to protect them. That's what you have to do. So they're getting ready to go out. And as they're leaving to go out, they walk by the old guy, and Eric stuck his arms out. <laughs> I mean, you know, leaning forward. You know what kids do? <laughs> and the old man was standing there and looking at him and looked at the parents and looked at Eric and smiling and you know, he'd been playing pick boo and playing patty cake with them across the room for the whole meal. And Eric is just leaning and he said, may I hold him? And, you know, that's a tough decision, isn't it? You know, today, of course, with Coronas, we can say, no, no, you can't. You got some Coronas crawling all over you. I can see him. I'm not going to let you hold my baby. But back then, there was no reason not to other than the fact that he did not look like they looked. Eric didn't care. He had rapport. He leaned over. Mom said, okay, and gave him to Eric. And Eric grabbed a hold of this man and put his arms around his neck, laid his head on his overstuffed, overpadded shoulders, and just laid there and just patted the old guy. And the old guy just was just crying, tears running down his face. 
And he said, thank you for the best Christmas gift I've ever received in my life. Oh, man. I have to tell you, when I was 16 years old and I found Jesus, or he found me, I have to say that I was so thankful. I was so thankful that I was now being loved greater than I'd ever been loved before. My father's love was not there that I could see. I know it was there, but I didn't feel it. My mother's love was always there. And this was like 10 times my mother's love because my sins were washed away. The best gift I've ever received was Jesus in my life. And during this time of Christmas, during this Advent season, let's remember to care for others, especially those who don't look like us. And I'm telling you that the world is increasingly becoming a different place with different things that you didn't even know were a thing, and they're a thing. And God calls us to all people, all the time. And it's not just during Advent season that in Christmas that we are to have a soft heart. It's every stinking day of our life God calls us to have a soft heart for the lost and those who are marginalized. The best Christmas I've ever had in my life. Christmas came because Joseph and Mary, or Joseph cared about Mary and Jesus. It also came to us so we can learn to care for others and finally to learn to give whatever we have to give. Christmas came to Joseph because Joseph gave. He gave in. He gave up in his heart. He said, yes, okay, I'll take her. I don't care what people say. Can you imagine I don't care what people... Isn't it funny? Now, this happens. I, I've just seen it as a phenomenon. I've never done it, but it happens. I may have been tempted from time to time, but you know when somebody gets married and all of a sudden, pretty soon, they hear, you hear they're pregnant, right? What do you do? You say, yes, joy, yay, happy. Then you go, one, two, three. How many months has it been since they've been married? You know, you have that kind of weird thing that we kind of do in our mind. And I'm sure Joseph, everywhere he went, nobody had to even count on a finger. <laughs> because everybody knew she was pregnant before they got married. What's going on, Joseph? What kind of man are you? Oh, he's a manly man. He's the manliest of men. I've met many men who have been involved with people who have children that were not their own, and they treated them, and they acted as if they were their own, and they became their own. What a beautiful thing. This is my child, is what Joseph was saying to everybody. He learned to give. He didn't know what was exactly going to happen, but they had to run off to Egypt. Now, I have to tell you, I was in Egypt in February. Uh, I was at a church that was built on the site that they believed Mary and Joseph lived. So they believed that this is Mary and Joseph. They lived in this apartment. And when they tore that apartment down, they built a, a church on top of it. I was in that church. I was there celebrating uh, the, this love of Joseph and this love of Jesus and Mary. I was sitting there in this church thinking about it. And then not too long after that, we took a long bus trip. And it wasn't even halfway to where Mary and Joseph rode on a donkey and left uh, Bethlehem and came to Egypt where they had to hide out because the king was killing all of the little babies babies because he was a jealous human being and God was doing something supernatural and got them out of there and went to Egypt a long way away he separated himself from his family separated himself from everything he knew and went to a foreign land and Egypt was a foreign land even to me going there Lots of people speak English here, but it's a very foreign land with foreign gods and all kinds of crazy cool stuff there in their country. But Joseph left under threat of their son dying. He gave everything. He gave everything. That's what Christmas is, isn't it? Us giving everything, giving our all, giving our all to God first and giving our all to our family giving our all to our, our friends and, and giving our all to this world and recognizing that we have a purpose for this reason you were born. Do you know you have a purpose in this life? I know where many of you work. Can I just tell you that's not your purpose in life? 
That takes care of your family. That takes care of the things you need to take care of so you can do the things that you need to do, which is the thing that God has put in your heart to do. And let me just say it's never too late. It's never too late to do what God calls you to do and to do what God. And you say, well, you know, Pastor Bob, I don't believe all this stuff, and I've had a bunch of junk in my life, and I, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't even want me to be here if you knew what I had done. Wrong. I live in this earth a long time. There's nothing you're going to tell me that you've done that's going to shock me. And all it does is deepen the grace of God in your life. That's all it does. The more junk you've been through and you still got to Jesus, wow. Wow. That's amazing. And you still got to Jesus? And here you are, all caught up with me? Awesome. Well done. Good job. God finds you, cleans you up, gets you to the place that you need to be for you to honor his grace, to fight the flesh, to enliven the spirit, to lift your load and the load of others is what you're called to do, to recognize that God has called you for a purpose. You're not here just to take up space. I think I told you a couple of weeks ago that people used to call us in a very consumer-driven uh, community here in Overland Park, and they'd say, what does your church have to offer our family? And I would always ask them at the end of the call, what do you have to offer our church? Right. It's not a given that I'm going to let you come. No, it's not a given that I'm going to, you know, but if you come with this consumer mentality, recognize I want something. I want you to serve God while you're here too. You don't just get to sit and get all fat and sassy. You get to come and be a part of the family of God and be involved in what we're doing. We expect you to be involved in the work of God faith chapel we expect you to contribute to make a part to do the things that god has called you that make you uniquely you to minister to the lives of the people that maybe i can't minister to it's not my job you don't pay me to minister uh, to everybody that's not that's not what this is about it's about equipping. It's about getting us ready. It's about do us doing the work of God in the world and multiplying that effort. It isn't to have a big church with a whole lot of people so we can say, oh, look what we've done. Isn't this great? This is, this is fun. It's big. No, it's that we can multiply his work in the world over and over and over again. If we're not doing that, we're missing something. Because it's not something that, you know, well, we're not doing it, so we're going to be punished. It's not that at all. You're not doing it, you're going to miss out on God's blessings. You're going to miss out on the beauty and the joy that he has for you in your life. Don't miss it. Don't miss it because of some philosophy or some part of doctrine that you don't like or enjoy or even understand. Don't miss any of it. Recognize that God has you in his hands for a reason and a purpose. And you got to find it, folks. If you haven't found it yet, keep going. You're going to find it. You're going to find his fulfillment for you. You're going to find that what you do and who you are in this world has significance beyond what you can even imagine. It's a paycheck you might work your job for, but it's what God has called you to do in your life, which is your occupation, which is what you need to think about in your life and in terms of your legacy. Your legacy is so set in Christ, it's amazing. My legacy in my family is four generations of alcoholics. That's the only thread that runs throughout my family's life. Four generations of alcoholics. I was determined that I would never do that and I would never be that. The doctors told me when I was 12 years old that I am predisposed to alcoholism. I am genetically predisposed. Not just am I predisposed to alcoholism genetically, my genetic material is, is uh, one of those that's susceptible to those kinds of addictions and those kinds of things, but my familial system, my family system, is also that which produces alcoholics, that which produces those who are able to, uh, to or not able, but who have this malady of addiction. And so I had this double whammy of familial system and I have this whammy of genetic predisposition, but guess what? Does that define me? No. 
all of my friends, except for one, who also had an alcoholic father, all of my friends in high school drank. I'm from Chula Vista. I'm five minutes from Tijuana. You know how easy it was to get marijuana? It's in Mexico. It's right there. I was surfing one day, and a big bundle of marijuana hit me in the leg. <laughs> Someone had thrown it overboard because the federales were after them and ended up on our beach in the United States. I mean, it was everywhere. All my friends smoked and drank and cussed, all of them. They said, Bobby, why don't you do that? I said, because my parents do that. How cool can that be? <laughs> That's dumb. I'm not going to do that junk. I decided after I got saved that I would never touch alcohol to my lips, that I would never put myself in an addictive behavior. I don't even have video games on my computer. Guess why? Because I will abuse them. I will. You'd say, Pastor Bob, what's your sermon about? Well, it's going to be featured uh, on a video game that I was playing this week. <laughs> I know me, folks. And I got to feed the spirit and I got to starve the flesh. But God is bigger than my addictive behaviors. He's bigger than my family's junk that they pass on to me. Genetics is nothing for God who's able to say, oh, I think I'm going to get this girl pregnant. Bing, she's pregnant. What? Do you hear this? This candle of hope that's burning, one of these candles of hope is burning. There's hope for all of us. Yeah. Nothing will take us down and nothing will separate us. No thing will separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. The only thing that will is you yeah. and your reset button, your button that says override because God allows you to override. I know a lot of people that push that button all the time and, they, and God still comes to them. Let's close this morning. Wally was a seventh grade student. He was bigger than any of the other students in his Sunday school class. His mother had been an alcoholic and when he was born as a result of her alcoholism, Wally uh, did not have the mental capacities that the rest of his classmates had, but somehow he managed to get by. Christmas came and they decided they're going to put on the Christmas pageant. And since he was the biggest, he was selected to be the innkeeper. And after all, the innkeeper is the villain of the story, right? And so they coached Wally just to be as mean as he possibly could be, which is different for Wally, but that's what he was asked to do and to play this part. So it came the night of the Christmas play and Mary and Joseph came to Bethlehem. And they knocked on Wally's door. Wally opened the door and said, what do you want? just really mean and gruff like they had taught him to be. Joe said, we need a room. We need a place to stay, please. Well, you have to go somewhere else, said Wally. There's no room in the inn. You can't stay here. Joseph said, but my wife's expecting a baby. And just any time now, isn't there some place we can stay? We are not protected from the cold at all. We need a place to stay. And no, said Wally, there is no room here. Suddenly there was silence on the stage. You know those embarrassing moments when the kids forget their lines or don't say their lines? We know all their lines. We know they should be saying something, but nothing's coming out. From behind the curtains, you can hear the prompter saying to them, be gone, be gone. Tell them, be gone, Wally, be gone. He was supposed to speak, but for some reason he got all choked up and he'd forgotten to say, be, be gone. And finally, after being coached by everybody, including those in the audience for several seconds, Wally managed to say, be gone. And Joseph and Mary sadly turned to leave. But just as it did, Wally said, wait, wait a minute. Wait a minute. You can have my room. The director of the play was ready to pull out her hair because she knew that Wally had ruined the Christmas pageant. But had he? No. He hadn't ruined it at all. He made it real. He made it what God's people are all about. Charity beyond belief. He didn't ruin it. He exemplified it. He said, you can have my room. Just as we said to God, you can have my life. 
That's what God said at Christmas time. You can have me, can I have you? Here's me, Advent, here's me, can I have you? And this is still the greatest gift of all. So when I ask you this morning, are you ready for Christmas? I don't know if you'll be able to get all your shopping done or not. I don't know if you'll be able to attend all the events that you're scheduled to attend. But I hope you are ready in an attitude and a heart that says, God, I need you. I want you. And I know that you have the best for me. I hope you're ready for the real spirit of Christmas to come. And that's the spirit of giving, a spirit of love, hope, joy, all the things that we celebrate at Advent. And Christ stands before us this morning, inviting us to make important decisions in our lives and in our eternity. He extends a hand, and his hand is nail-pierced. He says, I've given my all for you. What will you give me? Will you give me your all? So I know that traditionally in Christmas time, you know, it's a, a time of cheer and a time of joy and all those things, but I think that we miss it if we don't take a moment and look inside our lives and say, God, where are we right now? And where are we in relation to you? In the Garden of Eden, after Adam and Eve had sinned, they were hiding in the bushes, fig leaves over their private parts because they were ashamed. And God said, where are you? Do you think God lost them? The only two people on earth? No. He made them out of dirt and a rib. He knows exactly where they are. Remember when you were playing hide and go seek and you were hiding behind that little tiny lamp? And you didn't think your parents could see you because you had your eyes closed? And they were going, where's Bobby? <laughs> this is what God was doing to Adam and Eve. He was wanting them to know, where are you positionally? Where are you for you and me? I came here every day to walk in the cool of the garden with you every night. I come here and I say, where are you? It's for them to recognize where they are, estranged from God, ashamed, hiding in a bush. They've never had to do that before. And we don't either. We can say, here am I, God. Here I am. Come into my life. Change it. Move me. Use me. I'm ready. Maybe you've messed up things. That's okay. He's a God who's used to that. It's never too late. So take a moment with me, if you would. Give me one more minute. If you bow your heads for just a moment. If you're here this morning, and anything that we've said this morning kind of hits home with you a little bit. <clears throat> Something that you've heard or read or sang or prayed this morning has touched you this Christmas season. And you say, Pastor Bob, I, as I've been here this morning, I hear the encouragement of, uh, of your message, the message of God to come to him. And I've not been everything I need to be, but if you'll still have me, I'd like to come to him. This is an invitation for salvation, yes, just to pray that prayer that I prayed 40-some-odd years ago. But also to say, Lord, you're a God of second chances and new beginnings. I need one. And just simple prayer to him that puts us in the right position next to him. So if you're here this morning... And you just want to say, God, I need your help today. I need you today. Just raise your hand. Put it on, put it down. I just want to acknowledge it. No one else will look around. Just me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good. Thank you. Anyone else? I don't want to move too quickly. Anyone else? Ten more seconds. I know the Lord is speaking to some hearts this morning. I, I prayed about this and what I saw, thank you. What I saw was more hands than thank you than what I saw this morning. So I think there's a few more that just need to put their hands and say, God, I, maybe it's just I surrender. I give it to you. Amen. Amen. Anyone else? Amen. 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 Yes. Thank you. That's what I saw this morning. Thank you. Praise the Lord. Anyone else? Yes. Thank you. Good. Praise God. Amen. Let's, let's stand for this supernatural prayer. And it's not because I'm praying it. It's because we're praying it. And we're going to stand and we're going to surrender to God. And it's a simple prayer. And, and if, you, if everybody would just repeat after me, uh, that could be my Christmas gift that I know that everybody came here, gave their heart to the Lord. I would be so happy. But let's pray this prayer together. Let's pray it out loud together. Heavenly Father, Heavenly Father 
I confess my sins to you today. I need you to forgive me. I want to live my life for you. Thank you for dying on the cross for my sin. I love you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Isn't that great? Man, I hope you feel like I felt that first time. And every time I ask the Lord to do something special in my life, he always shows up. Amen? Amen. Well, God bless you, folks. Let me pray just a blessing prayer for you uh, on your, your wonderful Christmas and Advent season. Lord Jesus, thank you for all, all the folks that are here today. Thank you, God, for some that I have never met before, uh, but have a common relationship with them. They love you. I love them. We are all together. We're all brothers and sisters in Christ, and thank you for that. Thank you, Lord, for answering prayer. Thank you for salvation. Thank you for rededication. Thank you, Lord, for doing a work in us. We love you, God. Give my friends and folks, Lord, a beautiful Christmas Advent season. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you, folks. Have a great rest of your day.